hear me? I can, barely, but I can hear you. Quite a few of y'all on Zoom today, as well as um, DJ is away out of town, so I know he'll be missing. But I believe we've got everyone else here. Uh, Dave Mays is also out of town today and not here at the meeting, so this uh, the camera's just pointing. Is it even working on it? It's just two of us. Uh, maybe I should get next. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is up there? That's Lindsay Halleck. Yeah. Wait, I think, I think I can get you. You got everybody, Diana? Uh, Lindsay and uh, Andrew. Uh, Kat Coleman. Who who's on uh, mommy phone? <laughs> hey, sorry. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I, I was I was frantically searching for my iPad, and I'm like, well, I don't want to be late. Let me jump on. It's Jessica. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, thanks, Jessica. <laughs> mommy phone. That's embarrassing. No, it's, hey, it's quite quite all right. Um, let's see. Why don't, uh, Lindsay, I think we've got everybody that's going to be here. Um, okay. So can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Can hear you. Can hear you. Great. All right. So this is my first time running it virtually. Um, let me navigate to our agenda here. Um, all right, so the first item, well, we'll have to call it to order, I suppose. So um, if everyone can go around, I guess um, we'll start in the room physically and then move to the digital roll call. So if you guys want to start in there. Yeah, David Ingram. Uh, Richard Smith. Sean Sullivan. Okay, Lindsay Halleck. Catherine Pullman. Jessica Cannon. Andrea Bennett. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah, and now, yeah, just, uh, I guess, uh, move on to the approval of minutes. Uh, yeah, so David that. sent those out. Um, so if everyone, if, are there any changes that need to be made? Or does anyone have any questions or issues about the minutes? No. Okay, well uh, then I will make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Everyone in favor say aye. 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 All right. Well, we'll move on to the first item um, that we have today, which is an action item. Um, and so David is going to be talking a little bit about um, the carbon plan letter, which we reviewed during the last meeting. There were a few outstanding items that, you know, that group wanted to um, come to a consensus on. And so this is, it's my understanding that this is the final draft of the letter that a lot of other cities SSDN will be sending in. And so um, if we, you know, our determination today will be if we want to vote to recommend that Wilmington sign the public comment letter. So David, I'll hand it over to you. 
Great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I know the we've just got this single mic in the room, but uh, um, hopefully uh, y'all online can hear me okay. Yeah, sounds um, good. Great. Uh, yeah, this is uh, pretty much the final draft, at least of the, the main language within the letter. I think, uh, you, you know, you'll see some yellowed out sections. Those are some areas where they're still kind of getting uh, you know, work for some of the final cities that are, uh, are interested in, in signing the letter as well. So um, not only the city names, but kind of the uh, energy component uh, uh, that they represent as well. Um, but uh, as this letter moves forward through each city's uh, um, approval process, uh, it's getting finalized, uh, but regardless, the, the, the main points that uh, the letter is advocating for are kind of uh, uh, in that bulleted section beginning on page three. Uh, it was, it's just kind of uh, the highlights of what the, uh, the letter is going to be recommending to the utility uh, commission, uh, which they hope to uh, submit the letter the letter a little bit later here in, in August. Uh, uh, ourselves, we've got this letter going before uh, the city council meeting, uh, you know, if it's approved here through uh, the, the committee uh, next week um, uh, for their uh, approval uh, as, as a resolution, actually. So, um, But just the, the highlights of the letter, I just wanted to go over some of those real quick. Um, it's uh, really prioritizing uh, the, the quicker uh, reduction of uh, uh, fossil, fossil fuel reduction and in meeting the 2030 deadline uh, that the, the governor put forward in his executive order uh, uh, last year, which is reducing carbon emissions by 70% uh, compared to 2005 levels. Um, also focusing more on really a lot of the kind of community and customer facing uh, projects such as uh, energy efficiency, which is I know one area that we've not only talked about focusing on here within the city, uh, but uh, this is also uh, focusing on energy efficiency in the residential sector um, to reduce the amount of load that Duke Energy has to produce. Um, as well as uh, some of the, some of those demand side management programs, which are you know you can uh, which are programs such as being able to opt into uh, perhaps y'all all got a notification of, of those programs from Duke where you can let them remote in and and, and during those high demand periods uh, kind of be able to uh, decrease the demand that you know, home or residences or, or commercial businesses are, are drawing on, on, on the system. So, as well as uh, we're, the letter is really recommending that Duke, Duke focus on proven uh, renewable energy programs as opposed to, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, newer technologies that they were uh, trying to implement such as uh, hydrogen to, to gas plant technologies or some of the uh, uh, small nuclear reactor programs uh, that are really not even uh, in areas across the country haven't, uh, there's not any current oh working models of those. Oh boy. Yes. Focusing on, yeah, the renewable. Jessica, you need so to go on mute. Thank you, I thought I was. Dog, the dog is interrupting. Okay, I'm on mute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so focusing on those uh, proven technologies that are already out there as, as opposed to investing in unproven technologies. Um, again, focusing on uh, retiring coal plants, um, as I think the, the current plan only has. Uh, of the, of the four pathways, only one of them kind of meets that uh, 2030 uh, deadline um, and pushes retirement of coal plants further further down the line uh, beyond 2030. Um, 
which is, uh, uh, you know, while it may not affect some of um, our goals here in Wilmington, there's other uh, cities across the state that, that really impacts their clean energy goals. But we certainly uh, want to be able to support our, our, our fellow cities as well. Um, you know, and then it, those are kind of some of the, the, the main ones. Uh, some of the other um, bulleted points kind of really gets into the weeds like load forecasting and uh, getting into the transmission and uh, capacity expansion opportunities that um, are going to be important as some of these renewables come online, but uh, really kind of gets into the weeds a little bit. But um, would really look, like to take some of this opportunity here as well just to uh, hear some of y'all's comments or concerns or questions you may have had about the, uh, the draft letter as it's written and hopefully I may be able to answer some of those. Um, David, it sounds like this might have been discussed uh, last meeting um, when I was unable to make it. So I apologize if this was something covered uh, last time. But is it essentially that we would suggest any changes to language within our group here, and then you would take those changes and submit to whoever is the overall author of this letter? Like how collaborative is this document um, kind of set up to be? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I know it's somewhat in the final draft phase, but uh, I'm sure if we have some, some comments that we would like to suggest in there, uh, I can put that forward to, uh, you know, this was put together with the help of the Southeast Sustainability Directors Network and, and their staff who have uh, lots of time to support local governments such as ourselves and the others across the state. So, um, yeah, we'd be happy to uh, take any comments, concerns, or adjustments to the language back to them. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, David. Sorry, this is related. Go One ahead. thing to note is, you know, David, I guess being upfront about the timeline, if the changes are so important that we want to wait to get feedback from SSDM on whether or not they would include them, it would mean pulling this from the city council meeting um, agenda, which I think is fine if we feel like it's really important, but, but we would need to do that, right, David? Uh, yeah, because as the, the the draft letter has already uh, been provided to the uh, our kind of internal review process before it gets on the agenda, um, and it's 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 made its way through that approval process as as is right now. So if we were asking for any changes, yeah, it would likely have to be pulled. So, and you know. Uh, you know, note that these, you know, these are uh, comment letters to the uh, to the carbon plan that, that gets submitted to the utility council. Um, in, so, yeah, it's uh, it, it's just a way for um, us to be, I, I think, active in that process. Now, you know, I'd like to point out that um, you know, this is, this is kind of new for uh, North Carolina cities across the state to uh, to be involved in. Uh, you know, we, we previous, previously did this for the um, Duke's Integrated Resource Plan, and 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 now as as part of this, um, you know, commenting on the their actual carbon plan. Historically, you know, cities that really haven't gotten involved at, at this kind of phase of, of, of this process, which I, I think it's really important and and and. Uh, and a great step forward for uh, communities to be communities to be advocating for cleaner en energy for their for their citizens and you know kind of the betterment of the state. So um, yeah, I, I think I just wanted to kind of highlight that kind of historical background. This is these are kind of some new steps and efforts that a lot of cities are beginning to take to be more involved in these kind of processes. So. Just hey David, I was on a I was on a call this morning, and it came up that SSDN was also 
thinking about asking mayors and county commissions to sign something. Have you heard about that yet? They weren't um, very well, specific. Yeah, yeah um, part of the uh, Metro mayors uh, meetings, I, I, I know they had one like a, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, and, and one of the mayors actually brought up this comment letter and, you know, uh, came up, you know gave a, a background and highlights of the letter to the Metro mayors uh, meeting. So I think, uh, you know, kind of the, you know, all the mayors from North Carolina in attendance are aware of this comment letter. Um, but I think what you may be referring to is actually there's like a, a legislative agenda that uh, the Metro Mayor's Council goes through as well. And I think uh, yeah, SSDN was approached uh, to perhaps uh, provide some input uh, into some of the, uh, you know, legislative actions that, uh, you know, these various mayors from across the uh, state uh, may advocate for in regard to clean energy. So perhaps that was what you were hearing this morning. I think there were some emails going back and forth uh, late last week about that. Oh, okay. Okay. So similar, um, but uh, a little bit different subject than the, uh, this comment letter in particular. Andrea, were there specific comments that you would like to transmit to SSDN or certain parts that you feel like we can, that need beefing up or anything? Um, no, I, I had a couple questions as I was reading over it, but I think that it's stuff that um, likely, you know, I wasn't sure what the interconnected, interconnection piece was. Um, I read through that paragraph a couple times, and I think it might just be my lack of technical understanding on um, Duke's processes, um, because that was one of the ones that was kind of called out as including a more efficient and predictable interconnection process. It seemed very um, pertinent to consumers, but I wasn't quite sure about that. But I guess if it's being submit, um, that the people who would be reading it would understand it more than I would. But that was one of the ones I had, you know, a question about kind of fleshing out a little bit more. Um, and I know I'm biased since this is, you know, I was the co-chair of the equity side of the um, committee previously, but I any place that we can kind of beef up or add in. I thought they did a good job of including um, equitable access throughout the letter, but it's something that I've seen across so many energy plans that unless this is something that every citizen can have access to in some way, it's sort of, it's not going to be successful. It can't just be for a small portion. You know, it has to be widespread um, to get to as many people as possible. So I really appreciate what you said, David, about looking out for other cities and municipalities around us and not just the ones that have this action plan put together. Um, but just kind of keeping that sort of spirit and language in the in the comment was the only thing that I wanted to uh, or would suggest. Yeah, I would say that equity component was a, a big topic of discussion in developing uh, the comment letter. Andrea, and that second bullet point, that uh, energy efficiency and demand side management programs uh, definitely speak to uh, some of the programs, you know, targeted uh, at, um, uh, you know, the energy burden community in particular. So, yeah, definitely. definitely. A lot of yeah, it was it was yeah. definitely highlighted. I just as many times as you can kind of hit it as possible within the comments to really hammer it home is what I have seen in other um, plans as well. But um, but overall, I mean, I think it's a really well written set up sort of public comment. I, I thought overall it was it was really good. Yeah, and the, the interconnection piece, um, it's a big part of that I know was just trying to improve the problems that the old system had. They had a, like a, a big uh, a queue in place where uh, any, any kind of project that registered could kind of get in this interconnection queue, which is mean, what, you know, once a, a, a system is built and, and ready to, 
to go live, you've got to get it connected to the grid in, in some way um, and make sure the grid has the capacity to handle what you're putting into it uh, from wherever that location may be. So in case, you know, in case Duke would need to, you know, improve the infrastructure that they have to accept uh, the, the new solar or whatever that's coming online. Problem was that queue got incredibly long and there were projects that sat on there uh, that weren't actually being built. Um, so uh, I think the comments around the interconnection uh, is, is about kind of revising that whole process and making it work better. So there, there wasn't such a long delay in getting projects online once they're officially built, so. Got it, that makes sense. You mute her. Oh, I just said that that makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, no worries. I know we have some questions here in the room as well or comments. Well, I had just a comment that, you know, when you get done reading this, I don't know that, I mean, I thought it was well written or anything like that, but that the bullet points just don't like stick with me. Like, it almost seems like it would, it would be good just to have up front, like, these are the things. Because otherwise, Duke or whoever reads this is going to have to make that list themselves. I just like, you know, like when I had, I read it in one go, so yeah, I didn't you know, sit there multiple times. But um, it's just so much that it's kind of like when you walk away, there's no table contents or anything. So it's like, uh, what, what did I just read? Like what? I don't know. That was that was one of my comments. I mean, the other comment was just about, I mean, make a sentence more on off or when to say about the time. Being. Lacking, like they're, they're pretty, I guess, conservative with how long it would take, but it would be more aggressive, and also the amount of uh, you know, data wise offshore wind is low compared to the company. But I mean, you know, I'll approve, I'll approve this in that, you know, have those two comments addressed, but that's what kind of my perspective I had. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely, you know, a, a lot of content let's say with it within here that to, to, to get your yeah it just seems kind of like it happens like an online executive yeah i was about to say like a one page like just say you read it and you're like oh these are hot like so when you go to someone then you're not like oh uh, yeah well you if you reference on page seven to 15 but if like, you just had a table of contents Definitely make that suggestion to them. Yeah, table of contents here, just kind of something that easier to so navigate sure. back from the kind of bulleted points to yeah, you know, where it is in the. It also lets you kind of see how you're going to walk through the document rather than like get to the point. Jump right into the meeting. Yeah. Those are my only comments. Richard, anything? My view is something's better than nothing, so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, this is. Um... I think. I think from a practical standpoint, like, you know, there's so many organizations involved and so many moving pieces that, you know, every city waits for comment from every panel they have and you know sends it back and then pushes it another. You know, we'd never get anything submitted. I think from a practical standpoint, like they're just unless there was some kind of serious issue we had with this, I don't really think that there's the time or just practical resources to take to, you know, make little tweaks here and there. Um, I mean, I definitely think um, what Sean says would bolster the letter. Um, yeah, but, it's not. But necessary. but it's not it's not a deal. Yeah, it's not necessary. If it's something that's going to hold up the process, then. You know, I'm fine with voting to just approve it as is. And I, and I think, like, we, you know, unless we have a serious concern, I think that's kind of where we're at. So we have to approve or, or not. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, they, 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 there is a, a fairly strict timeline, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, that you know, that's part of it. It's like the, the whole kind of process that Duke and uh, uh, the group that they have kind of managing their public hearing uh, process is pretty, 
it was a pretty tight timeline all, all together. So um, to, to get this many cities already on board and you know fairly comfortable with, with the language, I think is a great step. Um, again, there, there could be some additional cities signing on and, you know, I, I just think it really kind of helps lay the groundwork for future work and collaboration with Duke and the Utility Commission going, going forward, you know, is kind of kind of setting a precedent that, you know, hey, all of these cities are really paying attention to this, uh, this stuff now. So, um, and, you know, this is uh, what is known as like a public comment letter. There's, uh, I think, uh, Charlotte and Asheville actually did like a formal um, um, where they actually have to go and present to the uh, utility commission. Yeah, so they, they, they did a little different process, but. Um. David, did you want to address some of PJ's comments? Yeah, do you mind, uh, uh, could, do you have that right in front of you that you perhaps could uh, share with the group? Yeah, so PJ, um, PJ emailed and, um, sorry, let me go back and find them. He wasn't able to attend today, but um, he had, here we go. Uh, his comments were that, um, he would abstain during the vote on Wilmington joining the letter or vote to delay the decision until more is learned. And he, he gave the reason for that because Duke has scheduled an evidentiary, well, the commission has scheduled an evidentiary hearing schedule for September 19th. Um, and he said his reason is really around the short time frame. The carbon plan is trying to hit with some unproven technology compounded by the financial impact of the current economy. So essentially, you know, what will happen is the next step after these hearings is that the commission has ordered an evidentiary hearing, um, which anyone, you know, would have access to the documentation from for the most part, but the only people who could give testimony or, um, or ask questions of Duke or for Duke to ask questions from our interveners, which the city of Wilmington is not. Um, so we would really just be, um, and well, I mean, I guess some of S is, I guess some of SSDN is, um, or some of the people on this letter are also intervening. Um, and so I think PJ's concerns was that, you know, I guess maybe, or the way I read it was that maybe something could come out during the evidentiary hearing, which would, you know, maybe render some of these questions like, um, like old fashioned or some of these points, like they could answer these points in the hearing and maybe he was concerned that our letter wouldn't be as strong. Um, so that was my understanding of his, of his comments. And I think, I guess my response is, you know, that, you know, it's the nature of the game. Duke always has the upper hand in, in matters like this because they're the utility and, um, and, you know, they, they have all the, all the information. We never know what they're going to do next until, so we have to sometimes wait for them. And the possibility is that, you know, they could try to answer some of these questions beforehand. And, and, um, but I don't think that is any reason not to send in a letter now. Um, I think it's important for the commission to hear often from folks who care about these issues and realize that a lot of people are paying attention. Duke's draft plans you know, are, are pretty bad. I mean, all of them include new gas. Um, only one of them even hits the goal that the legislation requires. Um, so I think it's important for the commission, you know, we never know when they could come out with a with an order on this. And I think it's better to get our opinions in, even if in the evidentiary hearing, maybe one or two points are rendered a little bit moot because of some new data that Duke brings. So I think my vote would be, you know, to go ahead. This doesn't keep us from submitting another set of comments later. You can submit as many comments as you want. So I guess, you know, that's, I understand what PJ is saying and, and it, it is kind of rushed, you know, it's, it's a lot to do a carbon plan in one year, but um, I think I would still, I would still encourage us to vote on, on the letter. When, when is this thing that PJ mentioned? When is September 19th? September 19th. 
It starts September 19th. Yeah, so yeah, next week. And the commission has to approve a carbon plan by the end of December. And I'm sure they're not going to be, I mean, if I were them, I'd be trying to do it before the holidays. I mean, it, we could get pushed into this further, but um, you know, it'd be a tight, it'd be a tight turnaround given how many actors and characters there are in this letter to try and come back to some sort of consensus afterward. I do have a question. I'm really related to our comments, but when you're trying to read the two plans, I didn't get much past page five. But, <laughs> uh, I mean, they're trying to have a carbon plan for North Carolina and South Carolina. And I mean, if South Carolina doesn't approve, I mean, you know, isn't that like a complete? It's got a huge issue. They talk about it a little bit in the first few pages about then they have to separate the two. That was just a thought. I didn't realize it was true because South Carolina and North Carolina so read the first few pages of the Yeah, probably. Okay. Sorry, wait. I didn't hear the end. You were saying that this is for both South and North Carolina? Yeah, it is a Carolina's carbon plan. It's not yeah. just North Carolina. No, no, Duke, that is a very clever propaganda messaging tool from Duke. They are desperate for it to be a carbon plan for both North and South Carolina because they very much benefit, you know, and to some degree, I think all of us do a little bit from the fact that their states span two, their systems span two states. The South Carolina Public Service Commission has said, uh, no way, no how are we making South Carolina ratepayers pay for this? So Duke is calling it the Carolinas Carbon Plan because they desperately need it to be, you know, to save money and to be able to rate base it across both states. But South Carolina has said, no, you can take your carbon plan and forget about bringing it here. So that's a little bit of a to be determined. So this, so this letter will only go before the North Carolina Utilities Commission. Separation to a policy separation. I don't think he is big a deal. Yeah, they said something. I mean, like I said, I don't read much of it, but it was uh, like they about the time he would take longer. I think the fight is over if they, if if it makes it easier to build a giant solar farm in South Carolina then that's what they want to be able to do, right? To reduce the emissions across the system as a whole. But the South Carolina Public Service Commission is saying, we won't approve that because we're not under the same legislation. So they, every, every, so that's, I think that's the concern. Anyway, sorry to bring that up. It's, it's open discussion, so. Yeah, yeah, I just saw that. No, that's what, yeah, I mean, yeah, Duke was, I mean, during the, you know, one of the public hearings that you could, one of the public hearings that you could listen into and when they were taking, you know, people's comments, they were talking about building a, a natural gas plant in South Carolina, but that wouldn't count to the North Carolina. Yeah, uh, see, I think it's going to get tricky because even looking at that Ingrid stuff and then. Yeah. Which was, yeah, which was the comments that people made right back. It's like, it doesn't matter if you build it in South Carolina or North Carolina, it's all part of the regional grid. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think this was well said. I think I'm all for it. Even if we, I mean, you can just make an update to it if something happens during this. Yeah, I mean, you can just send it to the addendum if you want later. Yeah, which could very much happen once, uh, once the, this letter goes yeah, I mean, through. you're going to be playing catch up no matter what. Yeah. I mean, it's you're not going to know that the state of the heart and nuclear, small nuclear reactors are until months after the, you know, the RNG specialists do. Or the yeah. and so, should we make a motion to vote on whether to approve recommending signing this letter? We need full approval. 
so. um, no, just a quorum. Majority, majority. As long as you have a quorum, yeah. Well, he said he'd abstain if we decided to vote for that. So. So, Lindsay, is that something you need to kick off? Yeah, I, I would make a motion to um, vote to recommend that the city of Wilmington sign on to this letter to the public uh, to the NCUC. I'll second the motion. Everyone in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any nays? Okay, it looks like we are signing the, or we are recommending that the city sign the letter. Very good, yeah. Um, so it will, um, it will be. Uh, David, sorry not uh, to jump in, um, but since we are on our remote meeting, if we could have a voice vote of each member um, on the roll, Lindsay, we'll just need a roll call vote from each member um, for record purposes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, Andrea, how do you vote? Aye. Kat, how do you vote? Aye. Jessica, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, I vote aye. And in the physical room? Yep. Rich votes aye. Sean votes aye. That's everyone. Okay, the motion passes. Is that okay, Corey? Uh, yes, that's perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, well, it looks like we'll go on to our next item here, which let me go back to our agenda is um, it's it's okay. So this is an exciting thing to talk about. Um, you know, David and Dave have both been really um, They've been working hard to try and set, you know, different issue priorities for us that are based on the actions that we ranked earlier um, this year. And so um, David is going to lead a discussion here on the recommended action item number seven, which would be, you know, creating a plan to transform the fleet to a fully electric fleet and to discuss like a purchasing policy around that. So David, I will hand it over to you. Yes, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, and, and and first, I'd just like to say, while you know, we're we're kind of bringing this recommended action item up for uh, some additional discussion here. Um, certainly doesn't mean we're uh, not uh, continuing to focus on things like uh, the recommended action item number four was optimizing energy efficiency of the municipal buildings. Uh, you'll remember we kind of had that spreadsheet that we're uh, going to utilize this kind of a, a tracking and informational page. Um, still going to absolutely continue to work on that. That, that we will continue, I would say, to be one of our foundational uh, action items that we'll you know, work on not only this year, but going forward. Um, um, I'm waiting to kind of uh, put that back in front of y'all once I get all of the FY22 uh, data updated into that spreadsheet. Just waiting on kind of finding. A, I think we have, uh, you know, I've got Diana here in the room uh, who helps with a lot of our utility billing. You know, a lot of the uh, uh, billings kind of end uh, halfway through a month. So I think I've got most of FY22, but just kind of waiting for this next utility bill uh, cycle to come through so I can get just that final few days of FY22 uh, information and be able to look at our total energy use for the year. So uh, probably at our, our next meeting, I'll uh, uh, hopefully have all of that data and be able to uh, get that energy efficiency uh, action item, uh, you know, back back up in front of the group to just kind of uh, kind of show where we are uh, with this last year's energy usage. But, you know, we also want to be looking ahead to some of these uh, other recommended action items. You know, I think we are doing an amazing job of, of kind of ticking our way through, uh, you know, these top 10 items that we identified. I think we've made some amazing progress already this year. Um, but Lindsay was 
absolutely right that uh, this is uh, in regard to electrifying our fleet and looking at um, EV infrastructure is one of the things that Dave Mays and I talk about all the time and um, you know what are, what are our next best steps there um, you know I, I think we both realize that we're probably going to need some kind of uh, outside help uh, like a, a vendor or issuing an RFP for a, a fleet uh, right sizing study and um, you know everything that that can involve as, as well as perhaps you know prioritizing what vehicles can be replaced you know sooner than later um, you know kind of looking at it from a big picture perspective as well as looking at the infrastructure that you know the city is going to need to install to uh, make this uh, fleet electrification happen over you know the next you know number of years five ten fifteen years as you know that's that, that sector of uh, the industry, I think, is going through exciting change, and uh, we, we certainly want to be on, uh, you know, the, the right side of, of that in, in regard to planning for, um, you know, not only the specific vehicles we're looking at, but as well as uh, the infrastructure. So, you know, I think we, we, we just kind of wanted to bring this uh, topic back up to the group. Uh, to uh, you know, ask for y'all's input and, and thoughts on uh, you know what you know what part of that uh, EV charging infrastructure and fleet transformation uh, would you like to see us focus on, um, and you know what 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 areas do you think? And how do you think we should approach it? I, I, I guess. So, um, just wanted to open it up to some some discussion around that, and, and just kind of, you know, this I would say, this is kind of early discussion around it. Um, it, um, you know, we're, we've already got our next year's budget cycle, or you know, budget uh, approved by city council. So, uh, this would be something that we were would be looking at making, you know, recommendations on, you know, like in like the November timeframe. So just kind of keep that in mind as we're beginning to make steps in that direction. So do we have any data on, you know, types of the number of each type of vehicle in the fleets or total fuel consumption for each section of the fleet and that kind of stuff? I do. Yeah, actually just finished kind of uh, compiling all of that from I got the data from our fleet manager earlier a few weeks ago and actually just last week kind of finished kind of compiling all of that. So I'd be happy to share that with the, the group. I can actually probably send that out after the meeting and sure. it kind of breaks it all down. So you want us to think, discuss like certain policies you should come up with that or not? <laughs> I, I, I guess we just kind of want to begin to lay the groundwork for, you know, what steps uh, should we be taking uh, uh, if, in, in making budget requests? Um, is this how's it gone in the past? Like, I mean, is there things that I, well, didn't fly well? I, I would say, I mean, this is it's kind of breaking new ground it, when we're beginning to, you know, talk about you know, trans, transforming the fleet more towards more electric. Um, you know, our fleet manager already does a, a great job with, you know, specifying hybrids uh, um, where, where possible. You know, we, each year where you know, that hybrid number, you know, continues to, to creep up, um, and. I, I will send out that, that data from this last year, and you know, you know, one of the metrics in there is cost per mile, and you can really see how how low the cost per mile is for the, the hybrid vehicles compared to all of the other sure. types that we have. So, um, certainly the argument for you know increase in use of hybrids until you know more EVs are available, and you know, I think our fleet manager still. We'll continue to focus on that, but 
um, uh, part of its availability of, uh, of you know, some of these new EVs that are out there that's slowing that process. Up. I think one of the things that <clears throat> should be taken in one, one thing that should be kind of planned for is I can foresee it being easy for the city council to kind of kick the can down the road on this as far as you know we have until 2035 to have you know whatever our goal is set for uh for the electrification so to get ahead of that i would say we should be doing the groundwork now for you know what a projected total cost to turn over the fleet is and you know say you know you may not want to do it this year but in the next 13 years we have to we're going to have to spend an X amount of dollars to get the fleet to where the goal that the city set is. So, you know, it would be better to start implementing that sooner rather than later, you know, rather than we get to 2030 and all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, we have 0% of the fleet has been electrified and now we have five years to get to where we need to be. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, right now, just looking at the size of the fleet, and of course, it's a variety of kind of vehicles, um, but it's, you know, 640, 650 total vehicles. Again, again, some of those are off-road equipment, whether that's uh, or, or other gas-consuming uh, uh, things that we have, whether that's mowers or wood chippers right. or things like that, you know, if it, can, if it, if it consumes fuel, uh, you know, some kind of a machine that consumes fuel, that's part of, part of that list that I have. Um, hey, but, so yeah. this is, this is Jessica, quick, quick um, question. And I'm sort of thinking as I'm speaking. So um, if we know that we're going to have maybe a better approach than recommending specific purchases or goals right now, if we could somehow come up with a, a path forward where by date X, we will be at such and such percentage EVs within our city, within the various departments, and that we can sort of, sort of almost transmit to the city council an FYI, this is how much we think it's going to cost per year to, do, to go where you need to go. So just, you know, almost like a sense of the committee where we're not asking them to do anything, but we have a little research showing this is how much we think we're going to have to do every year until 2030. Um, and then the other caveat to that is, I think the legislation that they are passing in Congress is going to affect how much making this transition costs the city. There's going to be money in there for the city, in other words. So maybe if we could start to put together sort of a timeline of where we think the city wants to go based on our goals and how how much of our fleet that would comprise every year between now and then something like that does that make sense would that be helpful to city council yeah it makes sense uh yeah uh definitely perhaps uh, you know I mean, that's why i kind of brought up the total number of vehicles i mean you kind of kind of do the math you know you know how many vehicles per year are we talking about so you know if we started you know this year then i think that's you know 20 20, 30 something vehicles uh, per year that, um, you know, that's a very crude way of looking at it. Um, but, you know, it does give you an idea of the, you know, volume uh, that, you, that we're talking about. Well, obviously it's not 600 of the same vehicle, you know, so some will be cheaper than others. You right, know? right. So we, can, we all have, they'll have to look at how they're going to break down not only the number of vehicles, but the cost intensity of each of those vehicles as well. Exactly. Yeah, what I mean, um, Dave says that there's just a, it's not really the bike, I don't know what you call it, um, a life cycle. Life cycle. Yeah. So, I mean, you kind of have to play that, play with that. I mean, you wouldn't want to be getting a short life cycle car and an EV, and then three years later, it's not before we reach the 20th or 23rd I'm saying you don't want to, but like, I think that might, with money. I think that might be a good first step is looking at. Like, just like you said, a very basic calculation of, okay, we have this many vehicles in the fleet. Our target is this date, you know, how many vehicles per year to get to that. And then kind of compare that to what the current life cycle stages are for the fleet. And, you know, do we have that many vehicles aging out per year that we would be able to meet that? Or are we going to, you know, would you have to be cutting some of the life cycle short on these vehicles or extending the date out? I think that would be a good first step because that kind of, 
will give you an idea of does the current, just kind of like the current steps that, that are in place, would that line up with what our goals are to begin with? Jessica, do you have something else? I don't, yeah, no, the only other caveat I was going to say is um, also to sort of help them and bolster their ability to not only stomach this, but sell it. Um, you know, we could build in the numbers. It costs a lot less to run EVs each year in terms of maintenance and in, even in terms of powering them up. I think the ratio is like one to three in terms of cost per mile driven. So they can build that in. They also turn over vehicles really quickly at the municipal level, which you guys probably know, obviously. And some of these EVs won't need to be turned over as quickly because of the maintenance issue. So I don't, that data is probably not easy to find, but I know it's out there. So that might be something we would be building in. Just, you know, our goal is to help them understand what the advantages are of what they're doing. Because spending money is hard. It's hard when you're an elected official. So as much ammunition as we can give them to, you know, to sort of bolster what the plan is, I think that would be beneficial. And that's all I was going to say. The, the clean energy... The technology. Yeah, tech, yeah. If the, at NC State, if we can reach out to them, they probably, I'm sure they have the data on the cost savings from an EV versus a standard electric or a standard gas vehicle. Um, and so they can, I'm sure they can give us the data as far as like, you know, hey, we can expect this much of a cost savings per vehicle saved, and that would help, you know, like like she said, help the yeah. council kind of stomach some of this cost. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, yeah, as and a side note, yeah, that, that resolution to join the Clean Fuels Coalition is going uh, to the city council uh, next week as well. So, um, hey, David. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, one thing I, I thought when we when we had our meeting to talk about this agenda, um, I thought Dave, you know, kind of broke it down in a really smart way about about how we might have sort of four different focus points going about this and you know maybe some of them can happen simultaneously maybe some of them need to happen before the other but one of the things dave said was okay first we need to know like we are gonna have to charge all these cars you know which parts of our grid can handle like a, a rapid increase in load and are there areas where it might not be able to um, and so that would be, you know, reaching out to Duke and understanding um, where the grid can support such a rapid transformation. That was related to a project that Duke is doing right now on a hosting capacity analysis. Um, and so that, that would, what? I saw that. Yeah. That, that, yeah. yeah. So there's like that. And then kind of related to what, um, to what I know we've talked about before, just like fleet optimization, right? So like before we before we change every car over to an electric vehicle, are there some cars that we don't even need? Um, so that would be like, I think what Kat had mentioned about like a fleet, a vehicle audit, conducting that um, and seeing kind of like what we, how we drive, who drives, who needs to drive. Then the third one Dave had mentioned was like the actual purchasing policy. How do we, um, you know, how do we make the case for purchases, right? So like exactly what Jessica was saying, the cost benefit analysis, which we did when I was at CFPUA and it's like striking how much, how obvious it is that the switch to EVs are better. So really working that in so it is easy for them to make those purchases. And then, you know, focus number four is like how and, and where do we start? You know, so kind of using all that information then what comes from the hosting capacity analysis, what comes from the vehicle audit, and what comes from the cost benefit work, then actually making up a map to, to get there. Um, and I thought that was just, you know, that was, those were Dave's four areas of focus. And I thought that was really smart. And so I don't know if you and Dave had talked any more about that, about whether you would want us to kind of do those one at a time, or if you'd want to, you know, kind of break it into different sort of projects that are simultaneously ongoing and, um, but I guess, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to bring that to the group and David, maybe you could elaborate or update us if, if more has happened beyond that. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kat. I was, I was, I was gonna bring up Dave's uh, point, points as well, uh, points of attack, we'll, we'll call it. Yeah, so, you know, looking beyond just the, the vehicles, but the 
infrastructure that we'll need and, and, and um, uh, Duke's capacity to handle that and will there be uh, system upgrades that are, are, are needed to support that from the Duke side. So um, there, there, unfortunately, we didn't ha get to have a whole lot of other chance to, uh, for Dave and I to discuss it any further beyond our, our, our meeting. Um, Yes, so, uh, you know, whether these are like separate work groups or separate uh, areas for the committee as a whole to, to focus on, um, I, I think is something we can continue to discuss. Um, I, I, I know one of the things he did mention, I think, af after our call was, you know, this is, um, you know, something that we'll, you know, we'll likely have to bring to city council as well, whether it's, a policy recommendation, or if it's um, a recommendation to you know put down an RFP for um, for for an outside vendor to come and help to do a study that kind of uh, takes a look at uh, all of those items. So um, that, that was that was about as much conversation as we have we had following our. our agenda briefing call so um i'd be curious to know um if there are like if there are companies readily available that do fleet audits i mean i'm sure there are um and if so has the city of Wilmington ever done a fleet audit before and it's not or, or if so how long ago it was yeah not um yeah i i don't have the answer sure. to that i'm not, sure. I'm, not I'm not sure if they've done one in the past but Certainly not looking at the transformation sure. that, that, that we're we're looking for. Um, you know, this is one of the areas that the Clean Fuels Coalition can can help with in regard to. Um, uh, you know, I think we could probably uh, let them know, hey, we're putting an RFP out there, and you know, they can <clears throat> they have ways to publicize it through through their channels to um, get some experienced uh, vendors and. I think, uh, you know, Dave, I think um, already said um, there's a group that we're currently involved with is helping us look at our, our waste and recycling um, effort as a whole and making some recommendations. And they also do uh, some, some fleet studies. Mm -hmm. So I think they've already touched base because they, they know we're looking at this transformation. Sure. Sure. Um, so there's a a lot of work around this this area I think to get us to the point that we, we need to be but um, yeah I think we just kind of wanted to begin this discussion here to, to lay the groundwork to uh, get some rec recommendations that we can take to council um, to me kind of establishing uh, some kind of an official policy for the city as well as getting this RFP out for some kind of a, a fleet study, right sizing study, infrastructure study. I wanted it. I, I like it to encompass all of that. Um, I, I think those are kind of the the two bullet points I would really like to push forward. Kind of a get an official policy and get an RFP out for, for the study. I, I think that's a good idea, and I think also to to look at Dave's points. You know the the information from Duke on if we if there are any infrastructure upgrades that needed or capacity you know how how we'll handle the capacity I think that can happen simultaneously you know that seems like that at least to my mind that work is more on the Duke end so that's something we can request from them you know and, and just support them as needed to get that information but that can happen simultaneously to the uh, other other two goals that you said yeah and, and you know we're certainly not the only organization, large right. user here in the city that's going to be doing electrification right. work. Uh, CAT CFPUA, I'm sure, is looking at <laughs> electrifying their fleet. Um, I don't know. Um, so who knows what kind of infrastructure on the Duke side upgrades around the city are, are already, that they're already aware of or already planning. Um, you know, that's uh, that's part of the, the comment letter as well is, is uh, you know, 
uh, being a little bit more uh, open about the infrastructure in regard to electrification of the fleet across the state. Sure. That's, again, that's another executive order coming down from the state level that you know Duke's you know, hoping to comply with is as well as the NCDOT's got this whole uh, you know transportation plan uh, that Dave and I are involved with and there's a lot of uh, uh, work going on in regard to that too so um, do you want to add an agenda item for the next meeting to further discuss you know an RFP for a study and or uh, some kind of policy for each um, yeah yeah I mean I think we'll keep this topic on on the agenda I can share uh, that fuel usage yeah. data uh, for us to dig into a bit it's, it's as you kind of dig into the details of it there's definitely a lot of stuff to glean out, out of that mm -hmm. fuel usage report um, yeah this is yeah, kind of definitely early discussion around this topic. So really just kind of wanted to get the ball rolling here as, as kind of, you know, at least, you know, 10 recommended action items. It's kind of, uh, I think the next one that we could really make some progress on here in the next few months. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, like when you're talking about, you know, worries about having the infrastructure we do, It doesn't seem like much, but when you think of all the different organizations or mm -hmm. commercial um, entities trying to do it, I mean, yeah. Or, or like take our operations center, for example. I mean, we've got a lot of vehicles concentrated in that one small area. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're not sure you know, what what Duke's capacity is if we if we had to add a whole lot of electrification charging equipment out there, you know, what you know, what does that mean? Are they going to have to, you know, put another little substation out there or additional transformers for us to tap yeah. into? You know, what We're are not they? Parking one, one car on each block across the whole city. You know, they're all they're concentrated. Yeah, you know, like here, the police headquarters would be another kind of high concentration area. You know, maybe this area right around uh, our government buildings here downtown. So. Well, and, and that can also impact budget, right? Because if you are asking Duke to do that before is like before they are ready to do it or before in their minds anybody else in the neighborhood would need it, then that impacts your interconnection fees. Yeah, it, yeah, it's like we're not you know, at this point, we don't know if that's a, a cost of, you know, we would have to incur or that's just something Duke's, you know, already planning as part of their you know, their, their growth in that area. So, you know, what, what, what kind of costs are we looking at that we would be responsible for, I think is what we would be interested in. But yeah, that, that would be a more of a question to probably work out with Duke, I guess. Okay, so David, do you feel like what what do you feel like is the next steps for this? What what should um, you know? Do you feel like you have everything you need based on this conversation to bring the item back um, and maybe to to come up with kind of like a concrete plan with timelines, maybe working backwards from budget season, or what do you see as as the next step? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we're here. Yeah, we're we're at the point where I can lay out a timeline yet. Um, again, just kind of wanted just to be kind of a, a kickoff to get our minds thinking uh, about this opportunity and the best way to proceed about it. Um, I can definitely keep it on for our next meeting as an agenda item to perhaps share that fuel usage data and to kind of go through that a little bit, um, you know, begin to uh, you know, perhaps look at, you know, are there some other example policies from other cities that we may want to take a look at and could we incorporate something similar, uh, perhaps as a draft policy to, 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 to adapt and, and, and work towards our specific situation and perhaps get, you know, that to a point where we can vote on it to 
move it forward to uh, going to city council. So um, uh, I, I, I think uh, probably keeping it uh, keeping it going for the next uh, uh, meeting in September would be kind of where I want to go. Okay. And was, is the idea with the fuel usage that it would kind of give us a sense? I guess I'm wondering with fuel use too, like, yeah, I mean, obviously it gives us a sense about right sizing the fleet, but I wonder if looking at fuel use per mile might also, if that data is available, but gives us a sense for like which cars drive like X amount per day. Yeah, that info is 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 in there as well. So oh, that, great. That kind of yeah. Some of the vehicles, you know, work work on a hourly basis, so um, can't really. I mean, you kind of get there some some data from it, but you can't really compare it to the ones that work off of a regular odometer meter. So. That's that's uh, uh, not the certainly not the majority of the vehicles in there. So, but yeah, it's just a it's definitely a, a good chunk of data to look at and kind of get a feel for not only how much fuel we're using, but kind of the the vehicles that are used most often. Or, you know. Again, yeah, just lots of info to glean out of it if you want to dig into it. So I'll, uh, I'll make sure all of the, the data is complete in there and then share that with the group before, before our next meeting. So uh, perhaps you, everyone will have a little bit of time to take a look at it. We want to move on to item number four. We, we did have a, yeah, just some, Lindsay, do you want to talk about that or do you want me to jump into it? Yeah, I can talk about it. Um, so the committee member update is that Owen has decided, I think all of you saw in the email, that he's decided to leave the committee, which means that we have an open spot. Um, and I know, like last time I think we talked about this, David, you were going to go back and kind of ask like if there was a proper protocol that was set up if someone left midterm. Um, but also recognizing that Owen was, you know, we all kind of have different term lengths and he was one that had a longer term length. So having a conversation around how we would find, you know, how we would get a replacement on the committee and whether we would want to move them into immediately into a longer term fit or if as we bring in new people, they should start in the shorter term. So just kind of wanted to make sure everyone saw that and then I guess David give you a chance to update if you have any information about how that might work. Yeah, we, we shared the information with our with our, our city clerk who um, will be giving us some further advisement around it. Um, you know, since this, uh, since the committee members work kind of, um, you know, they were all approved, selected kind of through the city council mayor process um i think we'll have to you know it'll have to be go, go through a similar kind of approval process for, to, for the replacement as well um as well as like the the term length so uh, we shared we shared the info and kind of you know the need for filling that one vacancy with the city clerk and uh, we're waiting to hear back as far as what the next steps will be so um you know that that said, I think uh, you know the, the people that are on the committee. We uh, you know we kind of provided a list based on all of y'all's interests. Um, I, I guess there was we let y'all know that, um, that this opportunity was going to uh, be uh, upcoming to form this ongoing committee. Um, so you know I, I think how it worked last time was we provided a, a list of interested candidates to the mayor and. Um, you know, they get the final, 
you know, blessing, basically. So um, I think that'll be the, probably the process for this one uh, replacement as well. So um, stay, stay yeah. tuned, I guess. I guess the tough part would be that we just use the applications, the waiting applications, or? It, it'll have to, well, it, it'll, it'll have to be like publicly posted again. Um, you know, that said, if, if y'all know people who may be interested, you know, you just say, you know, hey, uh, you know, keep your eyes open for this opportunity that's going to uh, present itself. So, um, when did this term start? January. Yes. So, that's kind of where we are with the process right now. So, sure. we'll, we'll, it'll have to be publicly posted again. Um, but if you know people who are interested or, or might be a good uh, uh, a good compliment to this uh, committee, a knowledgeable. Uh, I guess you just got to let them know. I mean, you know, we were all uh, applying for multiple positions for this person. <laughs> it's a little tougher. Uh, yeah. Um, so. I, don't know. I mean, yeah. it doesn't get done quick. Maybe you know, like, well, but the, I don't think the first person's term expires in January. I think the first round expires at the twenty twenty at the end of twenty twenty three, I believe. Yeah. That's not positive. Yeah. Ten minus two and other people had some like three and some like one. So yeah, it was it was just so we wouldn't if yeah, we everybody replace everybody at once, yeah, right. So and then I guess, so the second half of this item is about the annual report schedule, um, which, you know, we're required to submit an annual report to city council on what we've done. Um, and the, the timeline for that is November, where we would, you know, kind of, I guess, um, present it in person to the city council at one of the November meetings. So, um, you know, that's something that uh, David and Kat and I will kind of start organizing as the chair, co-chair and, and the staff lead. And certainly we'll be kind of reaching out to this group to make sure we're not missing anything, to make sure it accurately portrays what we've been working on, what we want to do. So that work will begin soon. Yeah, again, I think we've made some great progress in this first initial year for a brand new committee. So I think there's a lot for us to, to be proud of for this first year and a, a lot for us to be able to share back to the city council. Um, yeah, so it'll be a probably try to keep this November kind of ish time frame for annual reports going forward. So that'll coincide well with any like budget requests that we need to make, such as maybe an RFP for a fleet study um, as well as just yeah just timely kind of end of the year before holiday season and you know things get hectic and people are gone so um, and we'll probably also um, alongside uh, this committee's annual report I'll probably also have our, our greenhouse gas annual emissions report to, to share as well so we kind of tie both of those together November timeframe. So just wanted to, uh, yeah, again, get that uh, kind of uh, time frame for reporting in front of the committee just for a heads up. Do you have like, an example of a report that uh, it was, it, that's the, I think that's the last, the that's last one. greenhouse. So yep. the last greenhouse, yeah. Yep. Something like this. Yeah, I probably could try to you know, try to keep them, you know, pretty short and sweet. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, are there any other questions or concerns or issues that anyone wants to bring up before we adjourn? I just want to make um, one quick comment. Um, I know I haven't been like a part of, of this committee for a long time, um, or getting to you know interact with you guys, and we've been mostly remote, but. I wanted to let you guys know that this um, wanted to let you guys know this Friday will be my last day with the city. I'll be moving to the town of Leland to serve as their first ever in-house staff attorney. Um, so thank you guys for letting me kind of join in what you guys have been doing. It's been great fun, and I know that you guys will continue doing great things. So just wanted to let you guys know that. So when you don't see me <laughs> here anymore. You aren't wondering why that is, but thank you guys again. Well, con congratulations and best of luck.
Thank yes, you. Yes, congratulations. That's awesome to be the first one. That's exciting. If there's anything that we can collaborate with over at Leland as a, a greater, a greater good clean energy wise, you'll have to let us know, Corey. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, well, sorry, sorry to see you go, but I know you're a great opportunity over there as well. So thanks for joining us uh, as, as as you've been able to over this last year. Hmm. All right. Well, I will, um, if there aren't any other questions or anything, any other items of business, I would make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Uh, I guess we have to vote on that or is it just someone makes a motion and seconds it? I always forget. I think it's just seconded. Yep, you're good. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, everyone have a good afternoon and um, we'll all talk soon. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Love your earrings, Kat. Thanks. <laughs>